Hi, my name is uh, Morten, uh, and I'm going to be talking about sort of SSH, device identity, and identity claims. I generally sort of think TPMs are cool devices that are sort of underutilized and we don't have a lot of good tools for, so I've been trying to sort of figure out uh, better tooling to figure out to, to give users sort of more power and to be a, a TPMs be better for people to be using. Uh, so we're going to take a look at how uh, we can do, we can combine uh, SSH or TPM attestation with identity claims from OpenID Connect providers to sort of hand out short-lived SSH keys. A uh, quick introduction, my name is Morten Linderud. I go by the nickname of Foxboron on the internet. I have been doing so open, open source developments for a bit over 10 years now. Uh, I'm an Arch Linux developer uh, and I've been contributing to a bunch of uh, projects like reproduce for builds, uh, the security team in Arch Linux, packaging and a bunch of other stuff. I've also been writing about secure tooling like GoUFI and SPCTL to also sort of enable um, people to get better sort of usable tooling uh, for secure boots. Um, yes, so the talk today is going to be sort of how we can combine machine identity with user identity claims. Uh, before we go into that, we will do a quick TPM primer because TPMs are cool and <laughs> also sort of complicated devices. Uh, we're not going to do like a th thorough uh, walkthrough with the TPMs because that's probably a bit too much. Um, so TPMs are cool devices. They enable something we call key shielding, which enables us to sort of make keys inside the TPMs, carry them out of the TPM, and make them sort of non-extractable. This is interesting. Uh, for a number of reasons, because when we sort of do as normally do SSH keys, uh, people can just take this SSH keys, brute force the password, and use them without you knowing it. Uh, TPMs prevent this because you need an active access to the machine, uh, which is online. The TPM has three hierarchies. You have the null hierarchy, which is session-based. It's every time a startup, you get a random seed, and everything that was created during that session gets deleted or rotated the next time you boot it. You have a storage key, which is for the lifetime of the uh, you can rotate that key, so it's sort of the lifetime for the owner. So all of the application keys goes into there. It's for the owner to sort of store their secrets and stuff. And then we have the endorsement hierarchy. Um, that's for the lifetime of the devices, and that's sort of what we care about, because the endorsement hierarchy is sort of how we can uniquely identify devices. We also care about attestation features. Uh, so TPM is capable of signing uh, what was created on the device and sort of give us proofs that it was uh, created on the, t t on the TPM. Um, TPMs are cool because, you know, you, if you want to install shader software in the machine and not be worried about uh, your keys getting stolen, like if you want to install cups for no particular reason, <laughs> you can prevent them uh, somebody abusing cups from extracting your keys. Uh, though uh, TPMs are a bit slow, so you can't sort of not really do more than sort of seven signatures, seven, ten signatures a second on them. Uh, the API is terrible, it doesn't really make any sense. <laughs> And we, again, we need sort of better tooling for it. Uh, there's also a slight issue where the cryptography on TPMs are a bit dated. So you can sort of, we have sort of RSA 2048. We don't have RS, 4K RSA, RSA. And we only use, we really have the sort of the elliptic curves P256 and 384. There has been some identifiers to search for ED25519, but there hasn't been any specs updated to it. Um, so that's sort of a problem, but it sort of doesn't really prevent us from using them. Um, so I started last year on the behalf of a friend of mine hacking on an SSH agent that stores TPM uh, keys, and it sort of makes available the TPM keys for SSH without you having to care about search something like PKCS11, which is just super annoying to use. Um, so it supports TPS keys. It mostly sort of does RSA 2048 and the NIST, uh, two NIST curves that are widely accessible. Um, it has support for you to sort of create open SSH keys and then import them into the TPM. Uh, it also has some cool proxy support where you can sort of combine all your different agents into one agent and do fan out key discovery on it. It also does host key support, but we're not uh, going to be talking about that today. Um, running it is very simple. We do the SSH alt socket and we just run the TPM agent. So you can also, of course, do system services. Uh, once you've done that, 
uh, the tooling is supposed to mimic what OpenSSH is currently doing, so there's no sort of innovation here. People like OpenSSH, so we'll continue using OpenSSH. And we'll sort of give you sort of the normal key creation scheme that OpenSSH, OpenSSH already does fairly well. Once you've done that, you can run SSH TPM add on the key, and you have it accessible from the SSH agent. Fairly simple. Uh, you can also, as I said, do the SSH key gem um, stuff, so you can make an ECDSA uh, key with a normal open SSH, and you can then wrap it to the TPM, and um, it will then only be unwrapped if you have your machine. To prove it works, I've been using it. Here's an SSH key uh, on my GitHub that I currently have. If you're curious if it's whether or not it's secure, uh, there's a reason why it says never used, and that's because that's a QR code. So if you want to try hack me, you can scan it, get the private key, that's a public key, and the password is 1234. Um, I've done this before. It's been active since the uh, start of August. Nobody has touched it yet, at least. So. Um, I think it's cool. <laughs> and this is sort of what prevents the key extraction stuff. You can have do all of this and you can't really do anything. Um, yes, so what enables us, or at least enables this sort of keys though, is the James Potomli spec uh, called TPM 2.0 key files. Um, it's a draft, it's over there. And it's an ASN1 uh, spec for doing TPM keys. It's quite nice. Uh, it's implemented by the Linux Keyring and the OpenSSH provider. Uh, so you can sort of do key sharing between all of these different impl implementations. Um, so you support uh, different loadable keys. You have the importable keys and you have the sealed keys. And I did sort of a nice um, Go implementation of this. Um, and yeah, so if you do this, then you sort of have these shareable keys for different providers. Uh, the slight demonstration of the Go API. Uh, you have sort of, you can make a new key with the user auth and the description of the optional fields you want. It will hand you back a sort of a TPM based key in the byte buffer. You can write it out if you really want to. And it also supports sort of this crypto signer uh, Go stuff that you can just pass around uh, without having to care about what, uh, what's going to be using this key. Um, so this is quite nice. Uh, you can also, of course, uh, bring your own uh, TPM objects. So if you use the Go TPM uh, software library, we can do an ES ECC template. We can do a create loaded call, which will give you back sort of the loaded TPM objects. Uh, you can just stuff that into a new TPM key, uh, call it loadable, insert output out public out private keys, and then description. And you have sort of serialized the TPM objects that you want to carry around. You can then just write this out. Um, this is useful uh, because you can then do use the TPM2 software provider uh, for uh, uh, OpenSSL that TPM2 software has written. You can make a key and you can sort of use the SSH TPM agent to uh, to sort of load it and use it. So it's sort of it's nice. You don't you're not necessarily depend on one uh, so key, one software that's able to consume this case. Uh, so yes. Again, Peaky, provider TPM, and then you can just import it again. So it's, it's quite nice. <laughs> um, so what I've sort of implemented, which was got me a bit curious, is that there's this importable keys OID, OID thing where you can do uh, remotely create a key and then the TPM can import it. Um, that means that you can sort of pass around encrypt the key prob probably, and you can sort of decide, designate only one machine to decrypt it. So uh, one way to do this is that you have the TPM2 create primary call. So this is going to do sort of the SRK um, parent creation for you. It's going to output on SRK.pem, which uses the ASN1 key spec. Uh, with this one, you can on the remote end, that means sort of a, if you think like a, a DevOps person that's going to give you an SSH key, they can sort of make their own SSH key for you. You can either use SSH key again, or you can use the uh, PGEN generator for OpenSSL. You can sort of have the remote do this for you. Uh, you can then uh, wrap this key remotely towards your parent. And what you'll get back is a key which you can then import on your client side again. 
Um, if you squint really, really hard, this looks like a way to sort of deliver SSH keys remotely to uh, different user machines. <laughs> it's not practical, it's a little bit weird, but it's sort of, if you squint really hard, like you just need some way to authenticate something and you can just deliver people SSH keys. Uh, so that's what I sort of ended up looking at. So that sort of brings me to identities and device at the station. Because, uh, we, can't, we don't really want to sort of just have somebody tell you, like, please give me an SSH key, and you just hand out SSH keys. That's terrible. You want some way to sort of validate devices, and you want some way to validate identities. Um, so, yes. So machine identities with TPMs is sort, of a bit pro is sort of a bit interesting because endorsement keys, which is for the lifetime of devices, they can't sign things. Um, you can't have the endorsement key on your machine, sign whatever you want to prove it's there. You have to do something more. Uh, for this to work, you sort of need to do something called attestation keys, which can, which can attest to the creation of different objects uh, and to sort of prove that you're in possession of some device. They do something called credential protection which is, again, an inc incredibly poor naming at some point. Um, so attestation keys works with something called TPM2 uh, certify. And what's, what that's going to do is that you make an attestation key, and it's only going to sign something that's, that the TPM has created for you. The way it does this is that it embeds sort of a byte string, which ensures that the only thing, uh, the thing it's signing has to be created inside the TPM. And if you try to pass this sort of small byte string uh, externally into the TPM, uh, it's not actually going to allow you to sign it. This is what's called a restricted key. Um, this ensures that we have some way of sort of validating what is created. And this is sort of the um, good way for us to sort of make something in the TPM and sort of ensure that the station tells us it's uh, valid. Um, this also prevents the forging of different attestations because the certifier is not going to, give, to do anything with um, external data. You can't forge these attestations and it sort of ensures uh, we can chain things back to the endorsement key and that these things are uh, protected. Um, so yes, the credential protection stuff is weird. Um, so you have two calls you have to care about. is a TPM2 credential activate, which takes the credential blob and the secret. This is what's done on the clients. Um, and then you have this TPM2 make credential call. Uh, it takes a parent handle, you have the object name, you have a digest, uh, but it's only really sort of a, a convenient call in TPM. You don't actually have to use TPM to do this. Uh, you usually sort of implement this on the remote end in software, uh, and then you sort of make the client decrypt this thing. Uh, the way this is done is me <laughs> copy paste this from the TPM spec. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> So you have, uh, you, you have the public uh, endorsement key certificates. Um, that's sort of the thing that approves this given machine. Uh, the ephemeral key in this, is in this case is the seed key. Um, this is done by, you have a parent, which is an elliptic curve uh, key, and you need to have some shared secret. The way you do this is elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman thing, where you sort of have this shared session token. Uh, you do the C, you do sort of the ECDH EC, uh, key derivation thing, which is going to give you a C point. This is going to be the seed, which is what you have to recreate on the uh, client side to prove it's correct. Um, you do a symmetric key, which is key derivation function with the storage label. I'm not a cryptographer, so it's, if this is bad, I have no clue. <laughs> it's just <laughs> what the TPM spec does. <laughs> Um, and then you need to, need to encrypt the identity, so you do a CFP over some algorithm, uh, or well, the, the checksumming uh, name of the uh, endorsement key. Uh, you do the SIM key that you created with the storage seed, and you do the CV. The CV is a credential value, which is sort of the shared secret. You then do the HMAC to make sure that you have the correct uh, credential and the client or sort of the remote end is uh, not decrypting something it shouldn't be decrypting, and it do sort of this outer HMAC thing over the identity. Uh, the blob that you deliver back to the client, which is, has to try to decrypt, is uh, a combination of the HMAC and encrypted identity. 
So you then you send out back the public part of the ephemeral key and the blob with the HMAC and the encrypted identity back. It's this sort of two things you had to pass to the credential activate, which is going to give you back the encrypted secret. And this secret, it can be a signing key according to the TPM spec or just some shared key that you want. Uh, what this proves is that if the client is able to decrypt this thing, uh, it's, it, know, it has the possession of the private part of the endorsement key and the attestation key. This is the most complicated slide of the presentation, so <laughs> it's going to be better. <laughs> Uh, so this, uh, so that sort of completes the way we do attestation, the attestation part of the uh, TPM, and what we, and that sort of only really proves that we're in the possession of a machine. We also care about ad the identities. Uh, TPMs are not that good with identities, like who we are, not what the machine is. So we need some way to sort of figure out if you're in the correct possession of some extra credentials. Uh, there's a spec called OpenID Connect, um, which does uh, JVTs. So then you have uh, something called identity providers that can sort of attest or sign that you did in fact log in to some service. Uh, and it can then say that, yes, I approve that this person logged in with this email and has this identity and this, um, this information. Uh, you can then take that blob and you can sort of ask the issuer to say, did you sign this? Yes, I signed this. And that's sort of a nice way for you to prove you're in possession of some identity. So the JVT. Uh, which is what you get. It has sort of three parts. It's, there's an algorithm thing. I don't know, really know this. <laughs> you have a bunch of claims about who signed this, uh, what this uh, user uh, is in possession of. It's a long, long thing. <laughs> uh, and it says who signed it, with which keys, which ID it has, um, and then you sort of have this signature thing at the end. This together, you can get uh, public keys from the uh, OpenID Connect provider, which could be Microsoft or Google and then you can sort of verify it. Uh, so these things are called identity providers. The main issue is even though it's standard, uh, it's not really standardized. Um, <laughs> so you have different things like Microsoft and Google. Uh, all of them do different things. Uh, Microsoft's going to give you different claims. Google is going to give you different claims. If you do key cloak, different claims. <laughs> And this is sort of tedious to implement. Uh, GitHub doesn't give you OpenID Connect as a user. It only does like the OAuth 2 sort of login uh, procedure. And it, the OpenID Connect spec has this well-known OpenID configuration. Uh, it's going to give you sort of the, this configuration of like what we have, what, what, which keys we have, what, which claims we support. And sort of the most interesting part for us is the ACR claim. Uh, that's what's going to sort of tell you if you did two-factor authentication or something else or some additional metrics, not just sort of the passwords. Um, yes. So uh, how do you know if the OpenID, the identity provider uh, verify the claims? The answer is that we can't really because the ACR values are not standardized. So Microsoft is going to give you something else. Google is not actually going to give you anything because they don't want to force a lock-in uh, with two-factor authentication. There is something called ACR value supported. That's an optional field. <laughs> so you're not really going to figure out what sort of ACR fields are supported. There is some attempts at standardizing something called silver and bronze, uh, but I haven't figured out who supports this yet. So um, all of this is complicated. I want to do like a quick point of concept for my sort of CA or sort of figure out how to combine these identity things. So luckily there's a publicly fun, no, there's a publicly supported uh, identity provider uh, that the Linux Foundation is supporting. It's called Sigstore. Uh, it does a lot of things, um, but uh, the most thing, it sort of does transparency logs and keyless signing, but we don't really care about this. Uh, it provides something called DEX. DEX is a federated identity provider thing. Uh, it takes all of the different logins. It allows us sort of one interface to log into this and give you back claims. Uh, it supports Microsoft, Google, even GitHub, and it sort of prevents me from having to figure out how to support all these providers. We just stuff it through Sigstore. It's not perfect, but it works sort of as a point of concept. <coughs> so 
um, now that we sort of have figured out how TPM stores at the station or some way to do machine identities, we have some way to do identity validation. Uh, we don't really want to sort of just hand out as long-lived SSH keys to people, right? That's bad. You want some more control of it. Uh, that's why we're using SSH certificates. Uh, so I didn't really know a lot about this when I started out with this. Uh, but the certificates allows one central authority to sign keys, and you can sort of deliver it out. It's a bit more flexible uh, than the normal SSH keys, and it's a different format. So what it does is that it allows us to define which users that can use the certificate, uh, called principles. It also does cap capabilities, so you can tell if you're allowed to execute things, source something, or get a TDI. Uh, it also supports uh, lifetimes, so you can say it's valid before or valid after. And this is sort of practical for us, because then we can hand out uh, short-lived keys during this exchange. Uh, luckily, Go, again, uh, makes this extremely easy for us to sort of set up. So we can just create some timestamps. We can initialize a new SSH new public key. In my implementation, it uses the public TPM template to sort of synthesize um, SSH key. And then we can just stuff this into the SSH certificate struct. You say it's a user search. You say it's a TPM key as a key ID. I don't know. You have the valid after, the valid before. Just stuff those into the field. Which permission do you want? all of them, <laughs> and you just hand this back to the user. Um, but the issue now is that we have their state certificates, we have the machine identities, and we have the identity claims, but you want to combine them. So the, I was struggling a little bit figuring out how to do this. <laughs> and I'm, again, not a cryptographer. I don't really do security. I'm just a hacker doing open source things. Uh, so I was looking at sort of the responses you got from the DEX instance. Uh, and I was looking like really hard and figuring out like how can I sort of jump through some way of having the identity provider sign something for us. And I realized the nonce value is, is, is uh, client controlled. So we can just pass things through the, through the nonce and the, and the remote and, or identity provider is going to sign something for us and hand it back to us. Uh, so what I wound up with is uh, JVT nonce abuse. <laughs> uh, we just, what if we just make up some value we know what it is, we hand it to the JVT nonce things, the identity provider is going to sign it back to us, and we just check if it's there. Um, so all of this sort of became the SSH TPM CA authority project. Uh, I'm going to try to do a demo now, but it's I didn't prepare this, so I'm not sure if I'm capable of figuring this out from the, no, no. That's the correct one. <laughs> so. Uh, what we effectively have here is that we'll, we'll run the uh, TPM CA authority there. Uh, we'll re run the TPM uh, agent. It's going to be listening to things. And then we do uh, SSH add list. Uh, we're just going to delete all these identities. Um, so this is going to give us an SSH uh, agent with no identities. Um, and we're going to try now to SSH into my NAS at home. Um, hopefully this works. No, it doesn't work, and that's because uh, TPM. Uh, we need this hack because we don't really want to like. I'll explain this, but we really don't want to sort of do like our own client. So we do a hack called match exec host. <laughs> Uh, and if we try uh, SSH into my NAS client, it's going to do some magic. It's going to open up SIGStore for us. And you're going to click the Git button. It does an authentication. It delivers a key to us. And we have SSH into our server. Total magic. <laughs> <laughs> so if we now look at identities, we see that we have um, a key and a certificate in our hearing, uh, and that's only valid for really five minutes or something. Um, so, no, it's, there we go. Um, so SSH TPM CA authority, it's, it's a POC, it's a, it's a hack. I wouldn't really use it, I wouldn't deploy it, but it's sort of a fun thing to mess around with. Uh, it does short-lived SSH certificates, as I mentioned. Um, it uses the OpenID Connect stuff to sort of give you provider stuff. And it does a credential protection uh, handshake for us to give us machine identities. Uh, I don't, you don't usually like when you look at these things, like the 
uh, like teleport, you need like uh, your own SSH server or your SSH uh, client to sort of do these things. I try to just hack it into the normal uh, SSH client so you don't have to run new stuff uh, in the setup. So we'll first create sort of a SSH CA thing. Uh, this key needs to be trusted on the remote end for you to uh, be able to do this. Uh, we'll did, I did a quick jumble configuration thing. Uh, so we do the SSH host you want SSH into. You say which files should be signed in this. I only really support TPM keys at the moment because it's, it's easy. And we have this sort of listing of users. Um, we have the username of the wait. We have the username of the person we're trying SSH into. We say which open ID connector we want. Um, and then we have the email which we uh, should be logging in as on the open ID connector uh, provider. And then we pin the public EK certificate public thing that we can sort of validate. Yes, um, to get the EK public search, I didn't figure out a good way to do this with normal tooling, so I wrote, wrote a sort of a sh short hack uh, called get EK, which prints you out the public part. Uh, that's the one we stuff into the configuration. Uh, we run the uh, SSH CL server, and this is sort of the, uh, the trick of it. Uh, match key, the match host exec thing, it allows you to sort of run, run commands during your SSH session. It happens before authentication. So I just have, I just extended the SSH TPM add command with like a CH parameter. We insert the host and insert the user, uh, and it will just autocomplete the, the transaction. Yes. So the attestation <coughs> protocol. Um, this is the hardest, I, 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 think I'm not, I think this is the hardest part because I have sequence diagrams, and I'm not sure how well that's going to be. Um, so I did the blog post on this uh, <laughs> not that long ago. Uh, that's why I was explain it. So if you want to reread the attestation protocol details I'm going through now, here's the blog post. Uh, it has the sequence diagram that chopped up. Um, but the CA authority has sort of two endpoints. It has an attest endpoint, which starts the transactions, and then you have the submit endpoint, which sort of completes the transaction and gives you back the secret uh, or the signed SSH certificate. Um, the attestation protocol is sort of done in a couple of parts. We do some key creation. We that submit the attestation of these keys. Uh, back, we get an uh, OID issue challenge, which is it's the nonce that we need to include in the provider. Then we have to decrypt the challenge or the credential, which has another secret value. And then we submit all of this. And then the CA is going to give us back the uh, signed SSH certificate. Um, so first we do the attestation key. Uh, this is the one that's going to sign all the things we do. Uh, again, we can't use the endorsement key to sign anything. So, and uh, confusingly enough, uh, we create a key. Uh, with, uh, which is that station key. Uh, we tell that the station key to sign itself. <laughs> and then we take that data station and we store it. This is going to be our SSH key. We call that the TPN bound key. Uh, it's going to do the same thing, uh, but in the certified creation API, we're going to do the attestation key instead of the TPN bound key. Um, we will then submit the attestation. Uh, so that's going to be sort of the attestation key, uh, the public key. We do the SSH host we want, we do the SSH user that we want, and the server at this point is going to try to sort of do this uh, validation dance that's sort of documented. Uh, we che I first check that everything exists in the config. Uh, we check that the AK pub at the station thing is signed. Uh, we check that uh, it has actually also signed the TPM bound key. And then we do create sort of two secret values, which is the credential, um, credential stuff and the uh, nonce. Uh, so we do sort of the make credential uh, call on the remote side, which gets delivered to the client. So this is sort of the challenge. You have to uh, uh, make sure all this is correct, and then you sort of have to send back it. So it's this what we call the challenge. Um, sort of the data itself is sort of easy. Uh, this is Go structs, but it's easily representable as uh, some uh, JSON structures, but we have the user and host of strings, the, e, uh, the EK and AK, uh, the AK and TPN bound key has this attestation parameter that has the signatures, the create information, and sort of how we validate that it was made on the TPM. Um, and then we do also just pass along the EK that we have on the client side. Uh, this is to ensure that we are not making sure that the remote side is sort of completing information for us, which is, should sort of give all the secrets uh, up front. 
Uh, back we get the um, credential that we have to have to decrypt. The secret is a shared uh, seed. And then we get the OID C issuer that we have to connect with, uh, and we get the nonce that need to be included. So the OIC, the issuer challenge, uh, that's us logging with the challenge nonce inserted into the client. We get back the JVT proof, which is signed and includes the nonce. Uh, we, on the client side, uh, do the activate credential thing. If everything is correct, the TPM is going to give us back the decrypted uh, secret that we have to give back. And then we just give all of this to the, uh, the CA server. Uh, we do sort of, the, we check that the GVT is correct. We check that, uh, or we check that this JVT contains everything we care about. We ha then hand the JVT to the issuer uh, to ensure that it was signed with the public key we, we demand. And then we, uh, yes, then, okay. So we, we sort of check the signatures, correct and everything, and then we check the JVT afterwards. Um, and we also then check that the uh, uh, credential that we encrypted is the same as the credential we got back. At this point, we'll, uh, we know the TPM bound key because we delivered that station. That means that we know the SSH key that we want, so we just synthesize the SSH key on the remote end, sign it, and just hand it back to the client. Um, so again, you have the secret and JVT, and then back, you get the signed SSH respond. Uh, so this is sort of the SSH key. Uh, this is the one we just do the internal SSH agent add-on, and that's sort of what is going to be available in SSH agent. And this is what uh, SSH add sort of shows you afterwards, which is the key and the certificate. Yes, this is. <laughs> I have no idea if this is a good idea or not. Yeah, I thought it was cool while implementing it. If it's bad, please tell me. Um, but still, we can... There's probably a, probably a couple of improvements we can make. I'm not sure if the protocol makes sense. I'm not sure if uh, nonce abuse in the JVT is a good idea or not. <laughs> um, and I don't do EK certificate pinning, which is something Teleport does, uh, which allows us to maybe do like, more platform stuff. I also have, would like some more features in the OpenSSH stuff. I would like to have uh, some way for us so the agent can have a sign at the station that this is uh, SSH daemon on the remote end has seen that we're trying to log in as this user with this key and this sort of sec uh, this thing. And then we can validate this on the remote end and check that, yes, this is an active, um, this is an active uh, connection that's being made that we should sort of sign or do something with. Because currently, SSH GPM add is just going to mint out <laughs> uh, valid certificates uh, for you as long as you're the correct machine, which is not great, but unless we sort of hijack the client uh, and the server. There's not really any good way for us to do this. So that sort of leaves me to think that the server should be, the SSH agent should maybe be aware of the SSH server um, when you do the sign requests. Uh, Matthew Garrett has also sort of suggested that maybe uh, we could have some way for SSH agent to sort of tell that if we see this extension, please use this socket uh, instead of just not being aware of it. Yes. So, uh, in conclusion, I <laughs> did an attestation protocol. I'm not sure if it's, it's a good idea. I implemented some key delivery scheme into the SSH TPM agent, written a bunch of code that sort of does all of this plumbing for everything, all of this to work. And I hope this is maybe, some parts of this is maybe useful for multiple people. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Morten, for this talk. And I guess, I hope there are some questions. If there's no question, I did everything perfectly, and I'm really happy. No, ah, there are <laughs> questions. So, uh, great talk. Uh, but I have a question about the uh, attestation key uh, self-certification. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I'm, I'm, I will try to guess first, is that the curse of using the Go attestation library? Uh, so, uh, I mean, I looked at the code, but it's using the old uh, API version of GoTPM, so I re-implemented it. Uh, so I read it, uh, actually I read both the canonical iteration on it and the Go at the session thing, and I did my own thing, uh, but yes. So have you figured out why we self-certify the attestation key? Because we don't trust it yet. 
So uh, I, I, my, the, the way I rationalize this is that we don't really trust the self-attestation of the attestation key. We only we retroactively trust this after the endorsement key is correct. Because um, I'm going now to show you the uh, in. I think it's this. So the name here is actually at the session key name. That the session key is part of the credential protection scheme. That means that we need to be aware of the remote and needs to have the correct at the session key and the prior part of the endorsement key to be uh, valid. So that means that after we do the, a successful decryption of the credential, that means that we should the TPM should be correctly aware of that the session key and the endorsement key. Uh, this is because make credential, uh, the parent handle is the endorsement key, and I think the object name is the attestation key. So if you can only do this credential thing if both of them is on the system. So that means retroactively, we have the credential. That means the attestation key is certified itself. That means the attestation key has to be on the TPM, and it all certifies the endorsement key, which has to be on TPM. I think that's how it works. I'm not sure if it's correct. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I kind of understand what you said, but uh, that happens at the end of the attestation protocol. So we can get away by just providing the creation data, yep. which has all the information about the attestation key. And yep. if the client is genuine about the attestation key and has the endorsement key, so we get the same result, basically the same security guarantees. Yes. Uh, but I, there's also sort of a problem because internally in the CA authority, I didn't want to carry over too much information. I sort of just want to validate everything. It looks correct. Okay, store this part of the session, and then we complete it afterwards. So I, I think it makes sense, but I'm a little bit unsure. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I noticed you use tail scale. I guess my, or at least for your demo. And I guess my question is, and this is a great talk, by the way. Um, for your use case, right, I, I know Tailscale was working on something where you can SSH using your Tailscale identity. Yes. Now, here's my question, I guess. Like, for your use case, right, it makes sense to combine authenticating the machine and the user. But I guess, like, yeah, couldn't, in your use case, often you just authenticate the machine, which is connected through Tailscale, right? Do you, do you know what I mean? Like, so, I mean, maybe you want to, like, periodically re-authenticate the machine. Yes. And this is a big question, I guess, but I don't know. That, that was just what I was thinking. Um, so uh, this is why, in my like when doing this, I realized I just should remove the tail scale because it, it conflates different things. Because when people see tail scale, they're like, oh, but you have part of tail scale. You don't need to sort of do this. But um, I think at some point, I think instead of doing this as part of the session, doing some way of re-authentication, removing the keys, adding new keys to sort of refresh them, would maybe be another scheme of doing this, and it might be a bit more flexible or makes some sense. Uh, I mean, this is partially based off on like vague posts from Matthew Garrett doing something similar, which is proprietary, and people suggesting something similar, and him writing thanks and being going like, yeah, maybe I can do that as well. So it's, it's sort of a bit sort of vague, chasing different people that has been doing something similar as well. But I, I, I yeah. I'm not sure if that answers the question, but it's maybe <laughs> something along the lines. OK, further questions? Okay, if that's not the case, then have another, another round of applause for Morten.